Welcome everyone. Welcome to Forgotten Feminists with the lovely Leora. Look at that hair. You look absolutely stunning. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Now, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, Leora. Okay, perfect. Yes. Um, so Leora and I were just chatting and we have a, a, the most amount of people registered for this than has ever happened for any Forgotten Feminists in the past. So Leora has been gracious enough to give us some extra time. So we will be running a little bit longer than the normal hour that we normally do, just to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask the questions to Leora that they have or to make the comments that they have. Um, so if at any point you need to leave, then just you can leave us a little goodbye message in the chat if you like, and then and then you could just leave us if you've only planned for an hour. But if you have a bit more time, then that would be wonderful. Okay, Leora, let's get started. Let's go. <laughs> so um, I would like you to tell me about growing up as a young woman in Saudi Arabia. Now, I thought you had five mandatory Islamic studies courses, yes. which is bad enough, but you corrected me and told me that you actually have six mandatory Islamic yes. studies courses. I mean, I can't even imagine. So with that onslaught of constant indoctrination, constant um, Islamic information, how did that shape your sense of self your view of the world, um, just view yourself as a woman as well in Saudi Arabia. Oh, well, uh, living in Saudi Arabia had its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, as a woman, I didn't really have a life until let's say the 10th grade. But before that, um, I wasn't doing much. So, um, my parents were religious and fearful of what people might say. Uh, at the time, we did have uh, six mandatory Islamic uh, courses. So we had Quran, we had Tafsir, we had Tajweed, we had Fiqh, Hadith, and Tawheed. Wow. And uh, yeah, um, you asked about my life there. So my daily schedule was just revolved around school islamic school afterwards and then just going back home during the um the three months uh, which is the summer break my family would actually send me and my brother to a sheikh in hurraimala which is a city in saudi arabia to just revise and and read quran and we would do that for the entire day you know how sheikh lives in their mm -hmm. homes right nothing no tv nothing is just Quran all day um and you'd stay there for then, the three months three months yes and then my family would come to pick us up when the summer vacation is finished what a uh, vacation that sounds yeah <laughs> the opposite <laughs> of the vacation <laughs> um, but uh, I mean as a young girl there um I was very obedient Mm -hmm. I was trying my best to be the perfect Muslim girl, like everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, I questioned everything that didn't make sense to me, but secretly, because you're not allowed to uh, share your renunciation with the rest of the world, right? Share um, your uh, renunciation. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. When you renounce the religion, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's about it. Um, but the Islamic teaching, because you asked about what, how did they shape? How did it shape uh, your view of yourself in the world? Like, how did you see yourself? You said, yeah, like you, you said you were being obedient. You tried very hard to be the perfect Muslim girl. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you, like, is that just how you saw yourself? That was your view of yourself was good Muslim well, girl. I saw myself as a, a slave to the patriarchy um and a sexual object to be honest uh, everything about me even my voice was aura uh, they wanted me to cover myself because a man cannot control his animal animalistic uh you know
Leora, somehow you got muted there. I'm sorry. Can you unmute yourself? Oh. Okay. oh, sorry. No, that's okay. So you're saying a man can't control his animalistic desires. Yeah. So if you get sexually abused or harassed by a man, um, you will be the one to blame. You know, mm -hmm. um, you should be ashamed of yourself. Um, I think that's how I felt about my own uh, sexual abuse. I felt ashamed for years, even though I was just a child, right? Um, I think that's about it. You feel like a sexual slave. Um, I mean, they let us go through FGM oh. to please a man as well. Uh, because a Sudanese man will, man will not marry you if you're not clean. That's what they actually say about it. Uh, I remember you learned the definition in your um, previous tahara. interview. He said mm -hmm. tahara, we, we call it in Sudan tahur. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was, a, that was about it. Um, and everything else, like cover up yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't do many things there. Um, so as you're talking, there's a couple of things that I, that I want to expand on, but one of them is the idea of shame, mm -hmm. because that sounds like, you know, for me, that was something actually Mashad, our mutual friend, her and I yeah. were just talking about this the other day, how we grow up our whole lives, just feeling ashamed of who we are, just True. feeling ashamed of existing. True. Not not even specifically ashamed of our hair or ashamed of our skin or ashamed of our eyes or ashamed of our voice, although all of that is true. But you are just so filled with shame that that it takes so long mm -hmm. to cleanse yeah. that out of you. You know, I'm seeing yeah. this this woman on Instagram. She's from uh, Iran and she's sharing pictures of herself in this beautiful dress with her hair out and she's just mm -hmm. talking about how it took so long to love herself yes and I'm looking at these pictures and she's in her 20s and I'm thinking man like I didn't even get there yet mm -hmm. like I still don't even feel that freedom that she feels like her yeah. you know and it's I didn't get there I'm still not there I'm still I still have all of that. You don't know you have it in an everyday no, still, life. Yeah. But, but it's many like layers a, to unfold. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like to a, reach that healing state. We're yeah. Not I don't know if I even ever will. Like it just. No, you will. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, it's ingrained. It takes time, deep, but you but. will. So how, what was your experience with, with shame and, and that whole shame and honor culture and how toxic it is for women. Mm. Um, obviously you've talked about some of the most heinous things, which are FGM and sexual abuse, because even the sexual and, abuse, you feel shame because yes, it's his, he can't control himself. So if something happened, it's because of you. Yes. You know? true. Yeah. But even the part where, the, the, when they tell you that you should be proud if a man beats you, according to the ayah in Sultan Nisa, chapter four, <laughs> they tell, yes, they, my father would actually sit down and say, you should be proud that, that any male in your family will put his hands on you to correct you. He cares enough about you. Exactly. To do the, yeah, yeah. So you, you grow up thinking, yes, this is, this is how it's supposed to be. And and you see your father beats your mom and you're like, oh, okay. That's, That's how it's love. supposed to be. And the mom just accepts it and they're okay. You know, they continue staying with the person and you just say, okay, that's, that's what marriage is about. That's what life is about, you know? Yeah. It's the same abusive relationship with their Allah, right? Yes. Love me or I will burn you in hell for will, eternity. Yes. Pray to me five times a day or I will burn you in hell for eternity. It's, yes, it's an abusive true. relationship. We're all primed for it. Yes. Unfortunately. <sighs> um, I'm curious about you saying, though, that there are some positive aspects to living in Saudi Arabia. What were the positive aspects for you? 
Oh, the positive. Well, look at it that when I when I started the 10th grade, um, we moved from a private school to an international school. And that gave us the, the opportunity to meet many other non-Muslims. Mm. And then we tried to be rebellious by just, you know, uh, going out with them after school. Um, and uh, we, we were exposed to a whole new life. Um, I don't, you know, you lived in the uh, Gulf area, so you know about the compounds. Right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is what happened. We were exposed to to a whole new, different universe within yes. Saudi. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then when you start working, you meet a lot of amazing people who don't have the same um, indoctrination. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they're. I call them free thinkers. Yes. So you yeah. meet all these people and you get the chance to somehow talk about what you keep deep inside of you mm. in, in terms of religious, um, I mean, in terms of religion. Yeah, um, yeah. And everything else in life. Mm -hmm. Mishari was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little troublemaker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love troublemakers. Um, so... I'm curious about your brother. So you and him were raised similarly in that you both had very religious upbringings. You both mm. spent every um, summer with this sheikh for three months. Mm -hmm. But how was how was it at home between the two of you? Like, was there that stereotypical difference that we hear about of how males are treated differently than females or you know what was it like in your household oh well it wasn't um we, were, we weren't treated differently okay. um he was we went through the same uh, the same abuse and we had to abide by the same rules so this there was nothing different in the way that we were treated Good. Oh, well, so yeah, you yeah. didn't hear a lot of, like, for me, it was, I heard Abe all the time, whereas my brother wouldn't have to, I would be told that I have to like do his laundry and clean up after him, but he would mm -hmm. never be asked to do any of those things. But you didn't have any of those discrepancies growing up? Well, we, we had to do that. Yeah. I, I took care of, uh, as a girl, I was, there was him before me, and then it was me. And then two other boys after me so I kind of served the boy the boys in the family <laughs> yeah 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 so you just grow up seeing that they don't tell you you have to uh to clean up after them you just see your mom does that and you you become accustomed to it it's the expectation it. yeah yeah I remember my one of my nieces reached out to me years ago she's since stopped talking to me but um we were we were chatting on Skype and then she says, I have to go. I have to go pack my brother's suitcase because he's going away for the weekend. Wow. And I was <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, my gosh, like even to pack somebody else's suitcase, like yes. I've been so far removed from that world for so long that I just I, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I was like, why are you packing his suitcase anyway? Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about your brother. When did you start to, so as I mentioned in the bio for, or in the, in the blurb for this talk, your brother unfortunately ended up joining ISIS. Mm -hmm. So he obviously, there would have been a, um, I guess a path to his extremism. Mm -hmm. Like you would have seen maybe some signs of him going in that direction. Um, so tell me about that. Like what was, you know, like in my book, I talk about, I saw my ex and the mm -hmm. reason why he ended up joining is not ISIS, but Al Qaeda mm -hmm. because um, he felt alienated in his school and in his home life. And these men were offering him like, you know, the highest levels of paradise and all this stuff. And so he gravitated towards them. 
-hmm. And then of course, ended up going to Afghanistan and yada, yada. So I'm wondering, and his family actually in Egypt were not religious. Like they weren't happy about seeing him mm -hmm. become an extremist. What was it like for your family? Because I've heard in the past with other people that I know who, who joined ISIS that they were celebrated in their families for, oh, look at he's become so pious and he's focusing his whole life on, um, you know, doing good yeah. things. So what was it like for your brother when he started veering down that path? Well, uh, as I told you from grade 10, um, he, I was surprised to find out that he's going through the same inner conflict when it comes to religion and everything. He was interest, interested in Judaism. Wow. Yes. And then he became an atheist afterwards. And he's not, you can see that on his Facebook account. He was, he was articulating his thoughts everywhere he didn't he didn't fear you know he was that this kind is of when he was like grade 11 or something from grade 11 until graduation because he went to sudan to study uh, in medical school since we're not allowed mm -hmm. to study that in saudi um mm -hmm. but i mean he wasn't religious he wanted to do a lot of things in his life um he wanted to graduate and then we were supposed to go to Germany together and just live and, you know, be our authentic self in that country. Um, and then uh, I just had to go back because I went with him. We escaped from wow. Saudi to Sudan because my, my father was never, um, he didn't accept the fact that I wanted to study outside of Saudi. So anyhow, when I went there, um, he forced me to come back to Saudi. So my brother remained alone in Sudan. Mm -hmm. And you know how Sudan is. It's just like a safe home for all the uh, jihadis mm -hmm. movements. Um, so um, he was okay the first year until he graduated. And then um, he started working in a hospital and he met a Canadian born and raised uh who just fucking Congress. exactly exactly um he just i don't know convinced him reminded him of the teachings that he used to uh go through as a child um it was him and the other person the canadian guy and he um they have 14 other doctors and they just all moved to um some of them moved to Libya, some of them moved to Syria to join ISIS, the Islamic State. Wow. Yeah. And there were 14, and you can read it in the newspaper. Because um, few of them came back. So the Sudanese government brought them back to Sudan. And some of them tried to escape again to go back to ISIS. Uh, and they came back again. That's when I when I heard the news recently about him uh, passing in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't, he wasn't an extremist, honestly. So Were he just- Were you in contact with him all these years when all this was happening? I was in contact with him, but I feel the mistake that I made is that I wasn't paying attention to his Facebook account because he was so loud about sharing everything about him wanting to join the um the islamic mm -hmm. state or caliphate uh, so that's the only thing uh, when he came back to saudi the last time to uh, to see us you can i was able to uh, see the change in his demeanor you can tell he just became so gloomy easily irritated by anything even the laugh of his my siblings mm -hmm. he will get irritated and he would Inside the car, instead of listening to the music that he likes, he listens to the Nasheed of mm -hmm. ISIS, which everyone knows, the Salil al mm -hmm. And it was just, it was strange. I could, I could just see it, you know? And, Did you uh, talk to him about it? Like, why? Are, I talked to him music? about it. And he said, he actually said, I want to join. Oof. I want to join them. 
And then I spoke to my mom and my dad and they said, he's not going to do anything. Mm. So they didn't believe that he was capable of doing that. What do you think happened? Like, was it just the fact that he was in Sudan alone and these were his peer group? And so there was just a lot of um, peer pressure or what well, do you, how could he switch from wanting freedom to, I mean, I, I'm just curious oh, if you know anything about his it's thought just process. The, I, I would love to, sometimes you just can't express it with words, like you have to go through it. And then the reasons are, are far beyond the comprehension of the, the mere mind of a person who never mm-hmm. lived in that community. Or they never went through the indoctrination that we went through from a young age. Uh, mm-hmm. The majority of the community, um, they praise the caliphate with all mm-hmm. honesty. They, they want the caliphate uh, to be back. Um, and I remember the first time we heard the um, the speech of al-Baghdadi, mm-hmm. their leader, everyone was screaming out loud, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Mm-hmm. We're so happy. And uh, so he was, he was just, he was just seeing that. And you see yeah. that and you say, oh, this is what people want. This is what people mm-hmm. um, are eager to accomplish in life. Uh, so, um, it's being celebrated. It's being it's- celebrated. And then he, my mom would always tell us a story that when he was a child, she used to watch this um, show about the jihadis in Sudan when there was the conflict between South and North Sudan. There was a war. So she was watching this show that shows you everyone who's going to jihad and they die. Um, I, I think it was called Sahat al Fida, something like that. Um, and then he watched it. And one day he said he was six years old. And he said, mom, when I grow up, I want to be, I want to die for Islam. Um, so many other reasons. I mean, he was, he was really depressed. He was going through a lot with my, 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 my dad. He endured a lot and he went through a lot of abuse, right, at home. Um, and the conflict, the inner conflict that you go through, even when you're, when you're a mu'min or a mu'mina, you still no, true have fear within you that mm. even if I'm a mu'mina, I'm not, I don't have no guarantee that Allah is going to, to forgive me or, or allow me to be in Jannah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I do understand them. I, at some point, I understand the struggle within him that he went through, because until this day, I'm trying to just break free from that completely. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's... I hear what you're saying, because when you first leave, it's a mix of so many different things. There's euphoria for the freedom, but then there's also mm-hmm. intense fear, intense loneliness. Yes. You know, intense discomfort with the chaos, because as a Muslim, everything is ordered. Everything makes sense. Everything is black and white. Everything yes. seems simple. Life seems so easy. You know, mm-hmm. like there's two plus two is four. Yes. And so I guess I can see that especially when you're feeling depressed, the seeds were there, you know, the seeds were in him. Yes, they were planted. Long they time were planted, ago. yeah. Yeah. And as much as he tried to break free, it's like that he fell back to his default that was planted at a young age. Yeah, and you feel guilty. Mm-hmm. And all these people come to you and you say, how could you not be Muslim anymore what if you die and you find that is true Mm -hmm. so it's just uh, it's been too much for him I think yeah and I mean it's I was going to say it's so crazy that your family tried so hard to get you guys to be religious like spending all of your summers with a sheikh and all that Mm -hmm. but then in the end you both broke free and escaped from Saudi Arabia and wanted to live your lives 
Yeah. Um, so were your mom, when you told her that he said he wants to join ISIS and she said, don't worry, he's not going to do it. Um, was there any kind of encouragement from your parents? Like, would he have felt like they would be proud of him if he did that? Well, they were, they were mad because he joined and they were, um, they wanted to keep it a secret because at that time when everyone was uh, preaching about um, how ISIS doesn't represent Islam, mm -hmm. um, everyone felt ashamed to say that I have a brother or, or someone who joined them because the, the laws in Saudi are really strict that yeah. if you even write about it in, on social media, you will get caught. But in Sudan, it wasn't like that. Uh, so my parents were, were really afraid. They didn't want to talk about it for years. That's why I've been silent myself. Mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't, uh, he wasn't celebrated. They would still tell him, oh, why, why would you go to Syria? I said, why don't you go and free Palestine? Mm. so it's what what the community accepts as as a, a great form of jihad is what the other community will, will celebrate mm -hmm. yeah so i guess he was getting acceptance from his peer group in sudan but he wasn't getting it from his family and the majority of the it. community of sudan you'll be surprised to see how many people are um they they love they love Al Qaeda. It's before them. It was Al Qaeda in Sudan. You know, uh, the the Muslim Brotherhood from Egypt and everyone else, right? Mm -hmm. And Nusra, and now we have ISIS, and I don't think it's um, it's going to end. No, I don't think yeah. it's going to. It's always either. going to be a new ISIS. Yeah, yeah, because the ideology is still there, going strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just like when they think, oh, we're going to kill bin Laden or we're going to kill al baghdadi and then everything's going to be fine. No, that's just a man. Like, that's not going to make any kind of difference. No. You know, these kids have already been, you know, they've already had the virus inserted yes. into their brains. Yes. And that's kind of what happened... I mean, this person that encouraged your brother to join this Canadian, um, I'm assuming a Canadian convert though, right? Excuse me? Was it a Canadian convert? Yes. Yeah, because they're always the most zealous. They're always mm -hmm. the ones that are trying so hard to prove their, their Muslimness. Um, yeah, but it was, yeah. it was pretty shocking when people from Germany, the UK, France, Canada, all over the Western world, educated kids in university and stuff, all went to Syria and Iraq and all decided to join ISIS. People were yeah. saying, oh, they got groomed online. And I'm like, they got groomed in like three weeks? Like, what is wrong? <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> these, you know. It happened in a few weeks. No, these, they had the virus it already in their brains and it yes. was just a matter of turning it on exactly and they were immediately ready like okay let's go you know that's that bullshit was put into us from the very beginning we always knew like we always talk about it like I don't know about you but for me I never thought it would actually happen in my lifetime mm -hmm. you know it's just something that you that you that they're that they're always talking about it every Friday khutbah, you know. Yes. The Muslims are gonna have a caliphate and we're gonna get rid of all the infidels and we're gonna kill yes. all the Jews and we're Until gonna this la, day. la 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 la. Yeah. This day. You see the comments, uh, yeah. remaining and expanding. That's the yeah. answer slogan. You see it until yeah. this day. Just the other day yeah. I, I got something like that. Yeah. And and th that's brainwashing. Like when you're going to continually say that over and over and over again to children, yeah. and then yeah. when they grow up and they see that it's actually happening, um, yeah, it's like they've just been activated. Yes, yeah, true. You know, 
It's really sad. Um, you know, I also wanted to comment on the fact that you said that you weren't paying attention to your brother's Facebook. It's not, it was never your responsibility to keep an eye on make sure like you're busy living your own life you're getting married you're having children you know what I mean like it was not I didn't mean when I asked you if you were in contact with him I didn't mean to insinuate that you should have been paying attention or something like that I was just curious if you had discussions with him as he was becoming mm -hmm. um, more inclined to join this group but it wasn't it wasn't because of that because recently I spoke to the uh, the mother of the person who lives in Canada. Oh she yeah. Still live here. So when I spoke to her, I told her that, uh, "Do you have any news about your son and his wife and the children?" Because the other the person took the wife and the children, and she said, "No, I don't have any news." And she said, "You know what, Leora, if you." If you didn't leave your brother and, and go back to Saudi, maybe he would still be with you. Oh, fuck her. Wow. That was insane. Say really. Oh my God. So you're gonna forget about, about your son. You know what you should have said? If you'd have raised your son properly, maybe he wouldn't have joined a terrorist organization. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I've had the audacity to tell me that. <laughs> Unbelievable unbelievable that's absolutely despicable i'm really yeah. sorry that she said that to you um yeah obviously you're not it's not your business to control your brother he has a mind of his own and he's going to do what he wants to do and you have a mind of your own and you're going to do what you want to do this is yeah. your life that you know this this reminds me back to the bullshit of my niece wanting to do the suitcase for her brother like we are taught that we are like that we are in service well you talked mm -hmm. about it yourself you said you're in yes. service of all your brothers like mm -hmm. that's part of the toxicity of growing up as a muslim girl is you don't get to be an independent human being that lives for yourself yes. you have to please your parents you have to please your mother your father your brother your cousins your family and the entire ummah you know, yes. like you're in service of everybody. You're in service of, of the whole entire fucking religion of Islam. When you walk around with hijab on your head, that's what you're being. You're being an ambassador for the religion. You yes. have to always be a good girl because anybody who looks at you is going to say that's a Muslim. So you always have yes. to be at your best behavior. Like, And you're going to get married. Yeah. By doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like that's the prize. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. They always, yeah. Nobody's going to marry you if you laugh too loud. Nobody's going to marry you if you, whatever, yes. like always the stupidest things. And I remember saying to my mom all the time, I don't care. <laughs> I don't want somebody to marry me because I know how to make tea. Like what? The fuck? Yes. You know? Like, it's just absolutely ridiculous um but I'm glad that you have lived your life and that you decided that Leora matters and I have one life and I'm going to live it the way I want to live it and I'm going to yeah. find my happiness and tell us about that so I want to ask you about your life today and how what you've accomplished because we know all of the darkness that you've been through mm -hmm. um so tell me about your survival and you're thriving oh well after uh, my brother left um, I had nothing to connect me to that place anymore I mean it could be the house because I think that the everything around me was changing and people were um, becoming more free but my family in my house they were still the same the same way they didn't want to change or give women their freedom Mm -hmm. uh, so I just, I left the house, I escaped in 2016, came to Canada, um, created a whole new life for me, and uh, met the man of my dreams, and uh, got married after that, and then uh, we have three beautiful children, um, writing my book, 
uh, which was something that I'm really happy to do because in my family was haram to even write poetry. Mm -hmm. So even though I got the opportunity to become one of uh, the writers there, my dad wouldn't allow me to do that. He would take all my poems and he would say, women are not allowed to write, you know, don't, don't write poetry. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, I mean, I'm living a happy life, a free life, uh, free from all the conditioning. And I'm still trying to heal because uh, the news about my brother is just recent. Uh, the 5th, was it? The 5th of May, or May, right? Mm -hmm. um, but life is amazing. Freedom is, is something that is worth doing anything in order to obtain it. Mm -hmm. um, that's well, you radiate it. that. You radiate that. And I love your the poems that you share on Instagram and the photos that you share. It's really inspiring and it's really beautiful. And I've spoken to so many women who say to me, like, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. I don't know if I, you know, if I, my, if I don't have any contact with my family or my community or those whole everything I've ever known since the minute I was born, how mm -hmm. will I survive? How will I find happiness? And you are a perfect example of somebody who was able to overcome all of that darkness and come into the light. And what you do now is that you shed that light on others, you share that light with others. Mm -hmm. And it's a really beautiful thing. And I'm I'm so, so grateful that you were able to get out and that you're able to live this life and that you met the man of your dreams. I mean, you absolutely deserve that. Exactly. You deserve to be pampered. You deserve love. You deserve happiness. All of the things that you were denied, you're getting them now. And it's so much That's sweeter true. now, right? Like to really it appreciate is. the rainbow after the it rain. It is amazing. Yeah. I mean, the freedom is... I know when I speak about, when I say the word freedom, the women who live in that world will, will understand what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a very um, misogynistic community, right? Yeah. And then I always, when I speak to those women who, who reach out to me, who still live in that community and countries, and I would tell them, I used to have days when I go to sleep at night and I wish that I don't wake up the next day. You know what I mean? And I really want them to just um, be determined to achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. And just whenever you have that thought, just, just imagine the life that you could have once you leave um, whatever you're going through, whether it's the country, whether it's your house, whether it's the, the, the community itself, you know, you just, you will be your free self and you're going to be your authentic self. And that what brings you relief from within mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I feel I feel so happy now I mean we were deprived of freedom and many people here will not comprehend that but I wasn't allowed to listen to music and now in my home whenever you come to my home you have music mm -hmm. everywhere <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. I just celebrate the list of things in my life mm -hmm. uh, I have a phone of my own that no one is going to come to take away from me and search just to make sure that I'm not speaking to guys you know that stuff mm -hmm. actually one of the ladies um who live in Iraq reached out recently yesterday and she was saying that her mom took away her phone for three days so she didn't have anyone to communicate with and express how she feels so you might understand uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the word freedom was a bad How word. How overwhelming that is, yeah. Yeah, like my mom would be like, oh, I said, when you're as if so it's like you. this. I'm like, yes, <laughs> please. They don't when they think about <laughs> sexuality right away. Absolutely. Oh, like, to Absolutely. So many men. Yeah, that's the it first nothing thing. nothing to do with that. I wasn't even yeah. allowed to express myself and express... Um, my thoughts by sharing my poetry mm -hmm. look mm -hmm. how how crazy this is you know yeah but now you can 
Yes. <laughs> share it with the world. Um, okay, we've got quite a few comments here, but I'm going to open it up to the group. Um, and anyone that has any questions or comments for Leora, if you could please use the little, uh, click on the reactions there and put your hand up or something so that I, I will call on you. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to read through some of the, the comments here while you guys click on your buttons. Okay, I'm going to scroll all the way up. There's quite a few. Um, so Erkan, oh, Erkan is here. I didn't even see you join. Welcome, Erkan. He says, any attention is good attention. It's such an honor to get beaten. Yeah, well, they tell you it's yeah, like you said, Leora, it's uh, yeah. it's because he cares. It's because he loves you. A man yes. that doesn't, and also they value toxic masculinity. This mm -hmm. is something that people don't get yes. here. Like the more macho and aggressive and the more of an asshole he is, the more he is like celebrated. You know, oh yeah, he knows how to keep control of his family. And if he's not, he'll be called the youth. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if you can translate that in, in yeah. English, but yeah, someone well, who gives the their the woman the freedom to do whatever she wants, yeah, and not control her. So insulting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that was my brother constantly getting all sorts of horrible, humiliating words thrown at him because. Mm -hmm. um, because he wasn't that kind of person. I mean, he was compared to the regular average man, but not for the Arab society. He wasn't, he wasn't aggressive enough. Yeah. Oh, our beautiful Sahara is here sending you love. Oh, thank you. And somebody is asking, what about radicalization in Canada and the US? So um, what are your thoughts on that? Like converts becoming radicalized. Like, do in you convert? think that we have a problem with radicalization in Canada? Well, I. It's it's so different because I was speaking about it with my friend the other day. They they don't know much about what the other community are going through in the in that world. So they have a whole different. Uh, Islam in North America. Mm -hmm. I know you're aware. Unicorn is that. Yes. <laughs> rainbow. You can go to a mosque and, and pray next to a man and all of that. The rainbow but, flag is up on the wall. Exactly. Yeah. So it's um, I don't I don't know about that because uh, the person who convinced my brother and fourteen other doctors to go uh, came from Canada, he was born and raised here. So I think there's a problem. Yeah, there is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and Regina says, proud of you, my friend, Laura, oh. we left the land of the Muslims, yet we still live in fear of their punishment for abandoning their religion. Yeah. And they still talk as if they are the victims in front of the world. Keep telling the truth. I'm proud of you. Thank you, Regina. She's one of the best, uh, Saudi feminists. Oh wow! Yes, she's the I'm one in Australia. And it's, here. it's three a.m. there, so thank you for wow. tuning. You are love. Appreciate your routine. Thank you. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, a couple of girls in Australia, two sisters were two Saudi sisters were found killed in their apartment under yes. suspicious circumstances. We still don't know what happened. <laughs> But it has all the earmarks of an honor killing. This is why when girls escape, they still live in fear, like Regina was saying. Yes. Because they they still hunt you down. True. Okay, so let's get to some of the questions. Um, let me just scroll through and see if there's anything else. Um, Tina, would you like to unmute yourself and chat with Leora? Yes, I would. Thank you, Leora, for telling your story. Um, as an outsider, I'm American. I, I, I just wonder about FGM because 
from everything I know, it's women who do it. So why can't women just stop it? Just stop doing it. Don't mutilate your daughters. It looks like it'd be that easy to me. But I know I'm wrong and I want to understand why. Well, there, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, awareness happening in the Sudanese community. I don't know about the, uh, the Egyptian community, Yasmin, but in the Sudanese, they didn't have um, any form of information to tell them that this is wrong. They just believed what a man would say, that he's not going to marry a girl who's not uh, circumcised. Uh, my mom actually did that when I was really old. I was in grade seven, by the way, not five years old. Mm -hmm. um, and then she kept getting pressured from every woman in her family. They control you. They even control your private parts, telling her, hey, is, is, your, is your girl circumcised? So you need to do that because she won't get married to anyone. Uh, so my mom, um, yeah, took me to this... Uh, the lady, she's a family, she's a, a nurse, sorry, uh, in, uh, in Saudi, imagine. And the Saudi community, they don't do that. It's not, it's not popular in the Saudi community. It's only in the Sudan and Egypt and other African countries. Um, but they don't know. I mean, I just recently got the apology from my mom because she, after being aware of it, she didn't let my sister go through it was something I really appreciate. And at the end, she said she had to apologize for me for doing that. And she said, I don't, I'm so sorry because um, we didn't know. We just had to do what must be done. So Thank Women you. Need, yeah, you're welcome. Um, I will recommend um, Tina, was it? Yes. Uh, I will okay. Hi, I will recommend that you read *Infidel* by Ayan Hersieli. She's Somali, um, but yes, it's on my reading list. I'm 14 books behind. Oh, okay, <laughs> but she goes into quite into detail about the um, how the community, like Leora said, they control everything, even your private parts. Um, yes. To the, just to give you a little tiny example, it was to the point that when you're in school and you know how the girls' bathrooms are in school, if there's yeah. a girl that has like a loud flow when she's peeing, that means they know that she hasn't been sealed shut. And so oh then they're like, oh, oh, oh my God, why is, just, why is she peeing so strongly? Yeah. So it's to that extent that the entire community is um, like shaming the girls that that their yes. family isn't having this done to them. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of just following what was done without thinking about why we do it. And also it's just internalized misogyny. You're absolutely correct. It is the women that do it to other women. Yes. Um, and that's, that's a pretty heinous part of it. Like I, I wish, I wish that wasn't true, but it's the same is true with child marriages too you know women are involved mm. in it women are involved in all parts of this they're just as viciously patriarchal as the men are yes. that's the truth True. yeah um somebody here asked a question about when you were in sudan oh david kramer asks um sorry when you're in saudi arabia did you face any discrimination or bigotry because you're of sudanese origin no, I didn't, honestly. I didn't face that. I mean, I was blessed and fortunate enough to meet really good people outside of... Uh, my main issue in Saudi was my, my family, my home. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have issues with other people. They're, they're really kind people. I mean, good. I've met so many good people, but you'd, you only might face discrimination based on your uh, color sometimes, you know, from other people. Uh, but it's just two, two only in my entire life there. So that so there is a little bit of racism then, like you're talking about yes. your skin color, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, people have heard the stories of how the word abd means black, mm -hmm. basically, or yes. abid um, in Egyptian 
culture, you know, they they would say samra. Oh, wahsha samra. Yeah. Like there's like this. They they celebrate light skin or white skin. Yes. And they have you know negative attitudes towards anybody with darker skin like when I go to Egypt I'd want to tan <laughs> my family would be like get out of the sun your face is going to get dark and I'm like I yeah. want it to get dark <laughs> um but because of course I'm coming from the other side of the world where being tanned is a positive thing yeah um but yeah that I don't know if it's um yeah, I mean, I know a lot of women, we talked about shame and we talked about hating your body and all of that stuff. A lot of that comes is with it, you know, the being constantly hearing about your dark skin or your curly hair. But it's, um, it's more by men. So the men really? dictate that. Mm. The man wants a lady who's circumcised, so we give him that. You know, I'm, a man wants a light skin color. We give him that. We do that to please him. You know, a man wants a straight hair. They do that. I mean, I'm talking about in Sudan, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you, they feel. I have, I have some friends who felt um, ashamed of their color, who felt ashamed of their hair, who felt ashamed of so many things. Because mm -hmm. the, the main goal there is just to find a husband. My mom got married at 16, mm. you know? So see the pressure. By that mm -hmm. time, you need to find someone to get married. You're getting old. Yeah. Um, I don't I know who is next. Off. Regina, were you next? Let's say you were. I think it's uh. Regina, yes. Oh, she unmuted herself. Yes, hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thank you for asking me today. I'm so proud about you, are, Laura. And I'm sorry, first of all, for my English. If it's not enough, I'm trying to speak English and help me for it's translation perfect. for everyone. Thank you so You're much. You're so um, in Arabic. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Um, I'm 100% uh, agree with Laura as a Saudi and as an ex-Muslim coming from backyard from Islam and um, typical Islam, Wahhabis, let's say. So, uh, and I put in, in 18s and uh, I live all my life in Saudi before I skip to Australia and be a refugee. So, I completely understand what Laura is saying. This is my life, what she lived. This is what I'm living. We can put a title, one title for our life. It's a scare. If we mm -hmm. want to put all the story for our life, one word, scare and scare and scare. Yeah. Until now, when they talk about uh, the peace of Islam, this is broken my heart now. And this is something make me... Uh, angry to be honest now in the in the politics of the world let's give example in australia there is um, a muslim member of parliament she's a woman put a hijab mm -hmm. she's a young afghanistan refugee coming to australia as a refugee the secular australia government give her a chance to be a normal human as a man so she learn as a man, she work as a man, she success as a man, and she's a, be a member of parliament. This is a huge, she deserved that 100%, but not because she's a Muslim, not because she's a put a hijab, it's because she's a smart. But I'm shocked when she come a member of parliament, she keep talking about Islam and about hijab and about how she proud about this. And she wanna make the Muslim women in Australia uh, be proud about that. And I'm shocked about that because I live in Australia for many years and I never feel in Muslim people there feeling any, um, any abuse. There, are, there is no abuse for Muslim in Australia. So why they talk as a, as a weak people or somebody hurt them? Because mm -hmm. the, what's happened is the opposite. We skip from Muslim country because we scared they hurt us, they make us feel scared. Until now, look at me, I live all this year in Australia, 
I'm close to be Australian citizen. And until now, I cover my face. I cover my picture. I didn't put hijab. Sure, I'm not Muslim. But until now, I'm scared to show my face to the world because I scared they will kill me if they found me in the street. They will kill me in my house if they find me. The Saudi government maybe do anything from until now. I'm, I'm keep cover myself from them and change my name and try to live in a peace and just to try to say the truth, what's happened for us in this country and how they dare talk about they are, they are the religion of peace. We, they they want to kill us just because we choose to leave them religion. We choose to stop believe a religion. We not choose it. I didn't choose to be Muslim. Mm -hmm. I didn't choose to believe Muhammad. I didn't choose to believe I'm Aura. I'm a half person and the man is the completely. I'm a, I study master for, for religion. I have a master in Sharia law. Yeah. So I completely understand this religion. My mom, like Laura mom, she's shocked when I leave Islam. She not believe me for many years. Until now, she's so angry because, oh, how my daughter dear leave Muhammad religion. And I said, mm -hmm. okay, because I study and because I think, and I cannot believe there is the God created me and make me ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Sure. No, God said that you must believe that. And this is, I think uh, somebody asked why the woman keep learning another woman. You are ashamed. You must cover yourself because Islam wash mind for a woman. So the woman believe I'm ashamed. You find a woman say, yes, I'm ashamed. I'm a half person. The men have a right to abuse me. The men have a right to control me. I have a half a brain. I'm not good thinking like, like a man. I have emotion and this emotion control me. So I'm stupid. You find a woman learn her daughter this. My mom learning me this. My mom want me believe I'm not smart like my brother. But I can't. I just, I can't. So when they said you leave Islam because... You didn't want uh, a control for your life. You want to live, sorry for that, as an animal. No, mm -hmm. we not live as an animal. We live as a human. So um, I'm proud about you, Laura. I'm proud about every woman inside or outside Muslim countries. They can say the truth. And I cannot say without scare because we still scare, but we keep going, say the truth for the world. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. So beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. I agree 100% with every word that you said, and you're absolutely correct that it is, fear is the main word. It's all about controlling us with fear. And, and also what you said about we're still scared, but we're still talking. And that's really admirable that we are not letting the fear control us anymore, that we're going to live our lives the way we want to live it and not let the fear control us. So it's, thank you um, so much. That was beautiful. It's so liberating to be yourself and just, you know, authentically yourself and and be loved for it uh, unconditionally mm -hmm. without someone telling you that oh if you if you do something then i'm not i'm not going to love you anymore or you shouldn't be in my life yeah. andrew am i on see if i can unmute myself oh am i on okay <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i'm working on the technology here well i, I was just curious to ask uh, um, you, you both, uh, Laura and also Yasmin as well, you, you mentioned this idea, of course, with Laura's brother um, going off to join Daesh, uh, the Islamic State. Uh, how popular is it? How common is it for this vision of, you know, we are indeed going to someday form a caliphate uh, in Islam? Uh, how uh, common is it for you to hear that in mosque or, you know, in your family, schools or whatever? I mean, 
yeah, I've written about that on, on sort of academic presentations before. And I was just curious, uh, you know, in your own lives, how, how prevalent is that concept? How often do we hear about killing the oh, infidels and, you know, oh, the Yehud and having, getting control of the planet and making it all, making everybody well, bow to Allah. It's, it's in the, the Quran itself and the Ayat itself that the, the more you recite it, the more you will read more about uh, the infidels and how they should be punished and how they will go to hell. And it's all about that. And the kafirun kafirun, which what means infidel, right? Um, you hear it's it one in, of the main in, themes in Juma, mm -hmm. the Juma the Friday prayers, the Friday, the, Friday, the, Friday, the, Friday you know, the Friday prayer, and you hear it in in Ramadan. You know, I sometimes when you I hear think it, of the dua now, after every the prayer. dua after everyone, and and yeah. your your hand would Five be up, and you just you just yeah. have to repeat. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, whatever mm -hmm. the the, the imam is saying, and at some point I looked at myself and my hands were up and I said, Allahumma dammir al-kuffar al mushrikeen I'm like, why would I say I mean to that? Why mm -hmm. do I keep saying I mean to that? Mm -hmm. Like a bunch of sheep. Um, yeah, it, it basically um, says like, oh Allah, may you just destroy the infidels uh, and non-Muslims. And I would just say, I mean, I mean, at some point I just, I was forced to pray, but I, deep within me, I wouldn't say, I mean back that's when i felt that oh i'm i'm rebelling against this you know so it's everywhere every day more common than you every would single ever day. want to admit that's how you indoctrinate <laughs> and control people and, and brainwash them yeah every day same yeah. dua same prayers we, we pray 29 crackers yes i mean yeah every day it's not just counting the sunnah sunna and 29 Mm -hmm. the same dua every day you know so it's to break free from that you need you need a lot of time and you need to, mm -hmm. to work to be free and like regina said we didn't choose this you know we, we were born into this so that that indoctrination that brainwashing that repeating this bullshit 29 times a day that's happening from birth like God, we don't and when you when you hear that right now, when I um, the other day, a friend of mine sent me, I know she's going to see this, but she she doesn't ask about how I'm doing, but she keeps sending me um, verses from the Quran. And one verse was about Mujahideen or Jihad, and it just triggered me. I felt. I felt I don't know, I felt I was anxious. I couldn't even read it. I started shaking. So I told her, can you please? not send me, I, I love you, but don't send me these uh, verses because they really trigger me. And then she goes and she says, oh, it's just Quran. Why should that trigger you? <laughs> it's literally the most triggering thing on the planet. Because it's Quran doesn't mean that it triggers me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's how, how we live right now. I don't, um, I don't want to hear that anymore. No, no du'as, no Quran, no nothing. I just want to Live a peaceful life. She even said, may Allah give you hidayah. I said, mm -hmm. I don't need no hidayah. I just want to go through my healing process in peace, away from all of that. A friend of mine was recently traveling to Portugal with her husband on holiday. And she happened to hear him put on blaring out of a store. And she was Lovely. mortified. Like, you know, she felt, she felt sick, physically sick. Yes. And she stopped and she like left me this voicemail. She's like, you know, very few people are going to understand how difficult it is to be like living your life with your husband and walking on holiday. And then to hear that, like how jarring that is, mm -hmm. how aggressive it is, how, how it will just like give you that sick feeling for the rest mm -hmm. of the day, you know, um, <sighs> You, you yeah. still feel it. And I remember at the time when I used to speak to my mom, I think after this episode, she's gonna, uh, <laughs> she's not gonna speak to me anymore. But when I used to speak to her, she would say, why don't you put Quran in the house while your children are sleeping? And I didn't have the courage to tell her, do you know how that affected me as a child? Mm -hmm. No, it's just, it's difficult. 
And you, you people wouldn't listening want to children are they having to having pub before exactly. you go to bed. Yeah. Um, Sahara. My sister. <laughs> Hello, my beautiful friends. Hi, Leora. We are so proud of you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for sharing this, uh, your story. It's very deep conversation. And I'm so sorry for your brother. And, you know, you like Yasmin said, you know, you have to live your life. It wasn't your fault. It's not like, you know, your responsibility. Yes, it would have maybe been nice to check on him, but it's, it's hard, you know, when you in, in, indoctrinated that, you know that deep it's really hard to come back um because you are in in the community the same everybody's thinking the same everybody's walking the same as sadly um and but i hope he you know rest um may he rest peace you know and and i'm so proud of you the life you created and what you've been through and uh, like they said we are the tsunami we're not going to be quiet we're not going to be silent we're going to keep speaking Yes, it is scary uh, to put yourself out there, to put your name out there. Um, it, there's a consequences and risk that comes with it. But would we rather just hide who we are or would we live life to the fullest? And, uh, and as you know, when we leave this thing, there's something that we can't just live with ourselves. We have to speak out because there are people who are trapped in this thing. And just to let them know there's other way than what they know. There's other lives than what we've been taught and what we grew up. So I'm just so proud of you. And I'm just so grateful and blessed to be part of this. There's something, this movement is, is something. And, and we are coming and we're not going to be quiet and we're going to speak and after rest, you know. And, 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 and like Aliyah says, I don't know if she's here, but grow up. You need to grow up. I think in Muslims, I'm not saying all of them they need to grow up and they have to be okay with it. Their religion is gonna be criticized. People are gonna talk about it. We're gonna come out and we're gonna to say to no, no to Momo, no, no to Islam, no, no to hijab. And, and, and talk about the, you know, this ideology, the barbaric that comes with it. And I know we, you touched about FGM, female genital mutilation. As you know, I'm a survivor of this also horrific, you know, mortifying, um, procedure or practice that is still is continuing. And even is happening in the free world, um, it's disgusting. But, but when I had gone through this one, I went to because it was part of Islam. So I wanna ask you, cause you understand more Arabic, even though I learn Arabic, but it's not my first language. So when we were going through, um, you know, as a little girls, we've been told this is, and I, I believe there is a sources, there's a resource. I mean, there is a hadith, uh, either al-Bukhari, it explains how to do it and why you have to do it, uh, cut little girls, the clitoris is great basically, uh, because there's a benefit. And, and, and when we gone through, we were told it's part of being clean and purified mm -hmm. and being also virginity is emphasized as you know, Islam, mm -hmm. which is just doesn't make sense because this Allah doesn't even know how to create a genital. It's just bizarre. You know, I mean, he's a creator. If you want it, to cut people, your creator, your creation that you created, why didn't you do it before you come, you know, when the baby comes from the womb? Exactly. It's just the whole thing for me, that's where it started. You know, when I got through this horrific, uh, as you know, I, I had those questions. That's when I kind of rejected Allah, but I was a little girl. I was just like, why do you want baby to, you know, um, to cut them and to mutilate them and to do these horrific things? and it's just that's where it started and then of course when I came to the United States I'm grateful to be here then when I became illiterate you know uh, more I can articulate especially the language English than I read in the Quran in English and that's when I just couldn't rationalize and then I had a courage to say just to leave the whole thing and said I'm done with this thing it, it takes a long time because it's not everybody because of the fear I, I know you guys talked about the fear mongering because it's a fear mongering everybody is just if you even try to think outside the box you're like oh no don't think it's haram yeah. or, you know it all that yeah. yeah so what was it like i know you gone through did you go uh, through fgm are, are you a survivor of fgm yeah yeah you are okay so when you gone through were you told it was part of islam it was sunnah well that was you, after 
but before that because okay. um i don't know if you heard but i was in the seventh grade okay yeah. when you got okay yeah so my mom took me to um she was said, younger oh, than you we're gonna we were do six years old excuse me i was six and six years old we, so oh, no we were kidding. little we, we had to do it little because they don't want it it's, it's yes, just yes. Yes, you know. Okay, keep continue. Sorry. They didn't do it at that age, but I think at that time she was being pressured. That's what she said. But uh, no, she took me there and, and, and they just did that, you know. And at the time, I thought she found out about what my uncle did to me and she wanted to punish me. Wow. So uh, after that, I asked her, she said, oh, it's, it's Islam, it's Sunnah, and I should have done it earlier but I didn't want to do mm -hmm. it. Um, and then, um, yeah, they, they, they give you the hadith. And yeah. some people now are saying it's not even a correct one. It's well, the, the, the apologists, the Islamist apologists, there was yes. uh, sources, actually, they had it, I think, Islam.com. It was literally there, how to yes. do it and why you do it. They exactly. blocked. We're, they we're, took it out. You don't do it. Because we are speaking out. We are speaking out and showing the sources what it is so this website literally blocked take out yes. their the fgm part yes but it's it's out there i have a i have all a screenshot everything so it but is I, an islamic practice yes it's mm -hmm. there but they said it's the first degree because we have three degrees right what oh, we yeah. what they practice in sudan and and africa and egypt somalia yes the third i went through the third degree so Me that's too. even more more fine Horrifying, yeah. So, it's horrifying, yeah. But she said, she said all that stuff. She said it's uh, uh, you need to. It's uh, the time for you to get married, and you had to do it to clean you. Yeah, and I remember uh, girls because you know, I for me that life because I don't know, I was just the black sheep in the house, or I was just weirdo troublemaker because I didn't think about marriage. But my friend, my neighbors were they were fifteen or sixteen getting married, um, even. 14, you know, if you, you know, if you're, usually they do arrange marriage as well. Mm -hmm. So I remember like, you know, for me, not, not even thinking about it, this is not the life I wanted. I want a different life. I knew I had this dream, you know, when I gone through this horrific and, 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 and if, when you go through, if it doesn't go right, you know, the more mortifying is when you have to go through again. Mm -hmm. So I remember my neighbor girl has to go through it. It's just horrific you know, because they have to do it right. They have to mutilate you. They have to close everything. It's, and it's right. I think it was Tina who was asking, it's women who's doing to this to their little girls. Yes. And the reason they are doing is because they don't know better. This is the, what they've been told. They've gone through themselves. This is what they've been told. If you want to be a good Muslim, if you want to be purified and clean, it's all about clean and purified and being virgin, virginity, mm -hmm. right? Then you need to do this to, to your girls. And if you don't go through, um, of course, you don't get married. Yeah. And for me, I was like, I wish I didn't go through because I wasn't thinking about marriage or anything. I wasn't thinking about life. I was thinking different life. I had this dream that there is something, something, something different than what I know. Mm -hmm. um, but not everybody, you know, and, and not everybody has the courage. And even if they have the courage to think and dream, it is hard because you're being silent. You're being like told. Don't think it this way. You, this is the way it is. Walk this way. Because as I think many of us said this, Islam, when you're in it, it thinks for you. Mm -hmm. You don't use your brain. You have a brain, but you don't use it. But thank you so much. And I'll let somebody else, I think, have their hand um, speak. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So Sahara, for those of you who are unaware, is another one of my lovely Forgotten Feminists. So you should uh, go to Forgotten Feminists on yasmuhammad.com and scroll down. Um, Sahara is one of the first people that I interviewed. And Neda, who's the next person who has her hand up, was also one of my forgotten feminists. Neda. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good to see, see y'all. Likewise. Um, Leora, I just wanted to let you know that Mashar says that she is really sad that she's not able to make it, but she has to be a grown up and go to work. So, thank you. yeah, thank you. I mean, somebody got to make money, right? Exactly. <laughs> she apologized many times. Yeah, I love her to bits. Yeah, yeah. she's amazing.
So how are you? I'm great, thank you. Um, I, I have a question mm -hmm. that I struggle with, which is, um, you grew up extremely religious, like like I did, even though you're you're Sunda and I'm Shia. Well, I was, okay. but um, we like we were told what to think, what to say, what to wear, which side of the road we walk on. Um, eye contact which foot we enter the bathroom and which we exit, what to say before we enter a vehicle while it moves, if we're traveling and after we're parked and everything. And it's just that constant indoctrination of just constantly being told what to do while also um, being told that you're um, insufficient, that you're, um, uh, yes, that you have, um, can I translate that, for that, Nada, please? That's um, a, that's a hadith where the prophet of Islam, Muhammad says that women are lacking lesser in, brain, in intelligence yeah. and in religion. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go on, Nada. So, um, and even, um, as a survival of um, sexual abuse and all that, there is that ingrained feeling of shame that as a person, you're faulty, that your core is faulty, that your essence is wrong. True. And uh, to me, it has a lot of grief. Like to me, it's just, it's just grief. So my question is, how do you work through that on, I don't know, your daily practices where when you catch yourself, have a thought of like, I'm um, just talking harshly to yourself or something. Oh yeah, I didn't. Um... I tried my best when I when I came to Canada. I was going through um, flashbacks of everything that I went through, so I was having so many nightmares. Um, and then uh, I started meditating a lot. Um, I would use words of affirmation to remind myself that it wasn't my fault, um, and I'm not the one to blame. But when I was there, I was. I was really feeling that it was it was my fault, all of it. I, maybe I wasn't covered. I was a child, you know. Uh, you don't. You just have to focus on the moment where you don't have to think about it, and the moment you feel that it's it's the, these feelings uh, of shame are arising again. You just need to to stop that. That's how they tell you. All you need to to suppress some thoughts in Islam, back in the day they, when they asked us, oh, whenever you think about anything, you just suppress it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You kind of need to do the same way, but in a gentle kind of way where you say, you look at yourself and you say, am I ready to go through this journey of, of these flashbacks again? You know, you go through them. If you're ready, you go through them and then you deal with it. If not, you just say remind yourself that it, it wasn't your fault so you, you would it, you don't have to um take that worry with you and all that grief with you mm -hmm. and pass it to your children i have two girls now and i'm really overprotective of them in that part where i just mm -hmm. i don't trust anyone easily i don't i don't i don't trust males easily because my uncle was living with us in the same house. My mom was there and she didn't, she didn't really protect me, right? So I'm, I just make sure that I'm there with my children. I make sure that they're okay. Um, I mean, there is nothing else you can do, actually. Just uh, remind yourself that it's not your fault and that it's okay. It's, it's their fault. They're the sick people, not you. Thank you. 
Welcome. I appreciate it. <laughs> Can I give you um, my perspective as well? Um, I don't, it's, it just seems that we have this, just like we have so many things in common all the time, this is unfortunately another uh, thing that we unfortunately end up having in common quite often. Um, so I was just having this conversation with a friend yesterday where I recommended to her to do, like Leora said, a specific kind of meditation. It's called metta meditation. And essentially what you're doing is, what, what was my experience? What was her experience? What it sounds like was Leora's experience and I'm guessing was probably yours too, is that when you were a child, you were not protected. You were not, there was, you did not get the protection that you deserved. And so what you do in this meditation is you essentially think back to little Neda. You have a moment in your head um, where you go back to that moment when you should have been protected, you should have been loved, you should have been cared for, and you do that for yourself. So you as this Neda, you go back to your little Neda and you hug her and you tell her everything's gonna be okay you're not gonna believe what your future, how bright it's gonna be and how happy you're gonna feel. And um, it is incredibly emotional to do that. Um, when I did it, I was hysterically crying uncontrollably. I didn't, I didn't know that that was the meditation that we were doing. Unfortunately, I was in a public meditation circle. I didn't know that was, and it hit me um, it was, it was exhausting. Like for the rest of the day, it was probably for a few days afterwards. Um, but like, like, I'm sure you're going through this, Leora, when you're writing your book, when you yes. go through the most difficult things and you come out the other side, um, there is healing that happens. And so that's just been my experience. It's obviously not a cure. Nothing's a cure but it's one of the ways that hopefully will help you to move forward. Yeah, you just learn to live with it. Thank and you. know how to control it and cure yourself, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks Nasreen for writing the spelling of it as well. I appreciate it. I'll look into it. Wait, I've wait. stopped at one question here from Delida and there's it says 20 new messages. I haven't even scrolled down yet. <laughs> There's so many messages there that I will get to, um, but we'll let Dina go first. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, Dina. Okay, hi, Leora, yeah, this is Dina. Hi, hi my dear. Hey, um, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Good, I'm good, good. Okay, so I just, it's more like not a question, more of like a comment. Mm -hmm. um, like I'm hearing both of you guys' stories and other participants' stories when they spoke. And I can't relate to any of it. Like I'm a Muslim, you know, and I grew up in a Muslim household. And I never experienced like even like 1% of like any of this, you know? So I don't like, it's just like, I don't want to say it's shocking because I read books, you know what I mean? Like, you know, from... Muslim Muslim authors read their stories, read their life. And I'm just like, what the heck? And I'll ask my mom or my dad. Mm -hmm. And both of them were very open to me. Like I could ask them any question, like even if it's like, oh my God, it's an astaghfirullah question. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm trying to say? Like mm -hmm. they're very open and they'll explain things to me and say, no, you know, this was then, or this was explanation then. That's why they did that then you know, because of a war, you know, they explained things to me. And I was, it was very open. Like I was able to go to parties. I don't wear hijab. I was not circumcised. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to parties. I went club hopping. I went to, I experienced so many things in my life. You're so you lucky. Know? Yes. And, and I'm just like, like, you're very privileged. I, yeah. Is, is that what it is? Because I mean, even like my parents' friends, for example, their daughters are just like me. You know, they went club hopping. They, some of them drink in their family's home, oh. you know, and they're Muslim. They drink in their family's home. They smoke cigarettes. Maybe they don't, parents don't like the cigarettes part because of the health, but I just didn't 
experienced any of it and I don't know how to like rationalize it in my head. You, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. But it's, it's more about accepting and, and listening to us survivors. Because yeah, just it's more about understanding what we went through and, and hearing our voices and not trying to uh, suppress us and say that we're no, of course not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not. I'm not talking. I mean, about you, but about other uh, sisters who attacked me for speaking up many times. It's just about that, you know. Yes, I understand speaking up. Definitely, I I respect that hundred percent. You know, and it tears me up that you guys had these experiences and even the participants had these experiences in their lives, you know, and um, I'm just thankful that, you know, I guess like I'm grateful that I, you know, I live the way I lived, yes. I guess you could say, I, you know, I I'm grateful I didn't go through a lot of these things. Did, did your family live in, in Sudan? Because I'm yes. aware that you lived. Yeah, they lived. Okay. We lived there till I was like six or seven. And then we came to the States. And then we moved to Saudi for like two years and then came back to the States. Yeah, because I, I think it, it depends also on the, the community and the country that you live in. So mm-hmm. my parents, when we were in Sudan, as you know, we practice Sufism. Yeah. The majority, the majority practice Sufism. So when they moved, uh, when they moved to Egypt, where my brother was born, uh, they stayed for two years and then they were okay. When they moved to Saudi, they wanted to adapt to the community, so they had to become Wahhabism and Salafi, mm-hmm. right? And they yeah. started to change uh, the whole behavior or the, the the rules change by what the community wants. So for an example, yeah. When I go in the morning to go to the uh, the school in the morning, I'm a, I'm allowed to wear the the shoulder abaya. I don't know if you if you know that. So the one mm-hmm. that you wear on the shoulder, and then mm-hmm. I use, I use the the headscarf to cover my face. That was in the morning, and then after that, when I come back home, I have to go to the Islamic school. I would transform and wear the the head abaya cover my my whole eyes they shouldn't be showing I have to wear gloves black gloves black socks everything is black so that's for the Islamic school which was all of this is allowed by my father he has to say yes you can do that and then when I started working after that they they asked me to to um, not show my face so my dad said okay you can wear the the hijab just like that so imagine how confused we were Mm -hmm. I have to wear all of these costumes. I'll call them costumes. I have to wear all of that. And none of them is something that I chose for myself. And your poor thing, you were probably burning up in Saudi <laughs> and, and I felt confused. I was like, what, what is happening? Why am I changing? And when I went to Sudan, I had to wear something else. So it was just about uh, adapting to the community that you're in. It's just like so I think your family are, are just amazing. Thank you. And then my regards. I went to uh, Saudi. I'm sorry to interrupt you. And my father, we were in Japan. Dina, we can't hear you. Your voice has gotten really, really low. Okay. I'm saying it's like when I went to Saudi, when I was like, I think on sixth sixth grade, went to Saudi and uh, my dad was like, "Uh, here, uh, you have to wear this. And I was like, what is that? And it was like a hibaya, you know? like that black cover and I was like what the heck is this and he was like I was like do I have to wear that I was like but it's hot he was like sorry I was like it's just he's like that's just the rules in the in the country you have to wear it you know and I was trying to eat popcorn the first time my dad was like sorry Dina you're not supposed to eat here in public and I was like what yeah and my dad was like sorry he's like it's just it's just the rules I apologize (laughs) You know, I hated it. I hated Saudi. Yeah. Yeah, but that's I, it. I, Sorry. I just, it's just, it's just like so new. All of this is just new to me, you know? Yeah. So, and I, but thank you for opening up and talking about it. Thank you it's for very understanding. Important. Appreciate that. <laughs> thank you. Good <laughs> Bye. Um, I'm happy that you didn't live that life, Dina, and that you can't relate to it, but 
I don't think that you should feel surprised, especially if you've been in Saudi uh, or if you've been in Sudan or you've, if you've even been in a Muslim community in the United States. I'm sure that you would have interacted with many women and probably women in your family um, that have stories similar to the ones that you're hearing today. Um, I think it's wonderful that your dad is a good person and that you didn't have to live this life. But just being a Muslim, there's no way to deny that this is the life of Muslim women all over the world. I mean, I was born yes, and raised yes. in Canada. Sahara's from Somalia. Leora was in Saudi Arabia. You know, Neda was in Bahrain or Oman. I can't remember somewhere in the Gulf countries. Everybody was somewhere. And, you know, if you scroll through my Forgotten Feminists, it's like the United Nations of women. Mm -hmm. um, but we all have these common themes we That's may true. not have the exact specific experiences, but we have these common themes. Um, yeah. And so I'm glad you didn't have to personally experience them, but it was all around you. No, it's true. It's true. Yeah. I agree. Some of my relatives in Sudan were circumcised and it wasn't the Sunni. It was like the, the Pharaoh circumcision, which was like, yeah, it's a lot tougher than the Sunnah, you know, where you guys know it like they take the lips, they take the whole clitoris and they sew you like, the size of a matchstick head, you know? Yeah. It's, ter it's terrible. It's called the pharaonia, the pharaonic circumcision. Yes, that's the third. Yeah. Yeah. But we have um, to remember what this means is that the majority of the women in the, in the Arab Muslim wards, they don't speak. So we, you see yeah. all of what's happening as you think of it as this is the normal life. This is what's supposed to happen. So if you don't think of it as um a wrong you know behavior that shouldn't be done just like being uh, hit by the men in your family they won't they don't go out and speak about it mm -hmm. and you're actually asked not to speak about it outside so if there's violence inside the house you were asked by your mom who's getting the beating to not speak about it outside mm -hmm. and they call it shu'un a'iliya family business so imagine that they don't, they don't have the power to speak up, but now we have the power to speak up. So I hope people are ready. Yeah. Um, Dina, did you want to say something else? You're good. Okay. Yes, I, I agree, Leora, and they, hates that we're speaking up they hate our voices true <laughs> so how, how dare we like be uh, uncovered women with loud voices like it's you're everything right. that they hate you know you're they want us to be powerless <laughs> yeah our Sorry, voices we should be shamed quran what was that your voice is aura even when you read quran yeah when you recite yeah. quran so aura for our listeners is similar to your private part. <laughs> it's yes. like a, a shameful naked part that you should keep hidden. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's why Charlie Hebdo had a cover once where they had a woman in hijab and her face was a vagina because <laughs> that's what it is. It's cover yourself because all of you is a, is a private part. Yeah, I get it. Uh, so Nazreen said that the loving kindness meditation helped her a lot. So I'm, I'm glad to read that. Um, it is really good with childhood trauma. Um, there was one person who asked about if you had converted to Christianity. Oh, well, I did at the beginning. The story is, is different because I, I spoke about it. Um, I used to go to a, a Christian church, and then the the whole thing is about I I have this connection with the name Jesus, which is weird that no one um, will understand. So no, I'm I'm more spiritual now. Right now, I'm more spiritual. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just because when I was 
when I was uh, planning to escape Saudi, um, for the first time, my Christian friend, she got me uh, a candle and she said, oh, if you pray on this candle and you say, uh, Jesus, your wish will be granted. So I took the candle home and it was the night before I leave the house at night to go to the, not even before that, it was the night when I had to go to the, to the embassy to, to do the interview. And I prayed for Jesus for the first time. And throughout the, the whole journey, even after leaving my home um, 3 a.m. at night and at the airport, I was just praying to him that if, if, he, if he helps me in this, I'm going to uh, spend my life just, you know, mentioning the name or, or sending, uh, being thankful to this person. That, that, that's how I became like a connected with the... Uh, the name Jesus, but nothing else. So did you get the job? Did it work? Yeah, it worked. <laughs> it worked. It didn't work. It's I because don't... you were qualified <laughs> and because you were an amazing person and they wanted you to be part of their team at that organization. Okay. Well, I, I didn't know because everyone who goes through our um Everyone who lives in Saudi, for someone who never traveled, I never traveled, yes, me. So imagine the fear that I was going through, leaving my home alone, mm -hmm. going to the airport alone. Uh, my father was a, is a well-known person there. So I was even afraid of if someone recognizes the name on the passport and then they have to bring me back home. So I was in constant fear. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, and I've known so many Muslim ex-Muslim people that have gone through that journey that you just described, to be honest. And it's because when you go from living your life as a religious person with, mm -hmm. like I said, to go from order to chaos, essentially, it's, it's, it's a difficult transition to go from this is the truth and this is everything to go from yeah. nobody knows. You exactly. decide for yourself. You, it's like open that, that level of, um, free thinking is almost it's so daunting and it's scary and it's overwhelming yeah. and so many people went through the journey of becoming christians first because as they've told me christians are nice christianity very is nice, nice. the I churches are beautiful lovely you friend. sing nice songs it's yes. pleasant people are polite nobody's yelling about you know the punishment of the grave or the punishment in hell yeah. or they killing kill infidels people. or killing exactly. jews and yeah. yeah it's a it's a it's a nice thing to do yes and so yeah it's a it's a common it's a common thing and i recognize and appreciate and understand that many people gravitate towards religion because of that community we need it we're tribal we're human beings we're um we're social animals yes. and it's if i didn't have such ptsd from like anything to do with god religion any of that shit like i wanted absolutely nothing will control me if you have rules i'm not interested yes. Um, which is why I still don't even have a political party that I identify with, like nothing ever. Yeah. Um, it, you know, who knows, you know, if, because that, especially when you have kids and you have, you want family and community and all that, being part of a church is, is pleasant. It's a nice True. experience. <laughs> True. Yeah. I met really lovely people from there. So. Yeah. It's all it's different true. vibe. You go there to church and you just sing. <laughs> Music was haram where I'm coming from. Yeah. I mean, that's our experience. Of course, a lot of people grow up in Christianity and they have a completely different perspective, yes, yes. Uh, especially those who are grew up in more fundamentalist faiths. Yes. Lois has a line here that I just have to read to you before we before we go to Rena. She says, When I lost my faith, I found myself. True. Yeah. And I thought That's that was really beautiful. I'm still to share it with you. Getting to know myself now. Yeah. Uh, okay, Rena. Uh, you're muted. Either that or my microphone, my headphones. Okay, not working. here we are. Okay, good. 
I just want to say welcome to Canada. I don't want to take over this conversation, but I want to share with you that I did spend some time in Saudi Arabia from 1999 to 2003, and I did see a lot of female genital mutilation, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but I also saw women having so many babies, and yet the man, the father of one child would come the next, you know, the same day to visit his other wife. So all I can say is I'm glad I wasn't born there. But, you know, seeing that now women, well, how many are driving? Do you think that other things will change? Well, the, the, uh, the rules changed in the country, but it's really hard to change the mindset of, of people. They were indoctrinated for, for many decades, for eons, and it's just hard to change that over one night even though some in the country for example now you can a, a lady can live by herself and i have many saudi friends who live by themselves in their own apartments it was it was before um a sin and now they're living but some families are very strict that they would uh put the girl in jail for disobeying the family so it's like there's going to be a lot of, of change, I hope. I'm still hopeful. Um, and I hope that will happen. Take a to a century. It might take a century. <laughs> yes, it will take time, yeah. though. It will take a lot of time. Where, where did you live in Saudi? I lived, I was born and raised in Riyadh. Okay, because I live just outside of Jeddah. But, you know, I just want to say also a comment for everyone. I was raised Catholic in the Quebec Outbacks. And what I saw with the previous generation, there were a lot of rules there too, okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe not quite as severe, but there were, and, and now how I feel about religion is, you know, keep up your meditation. Let's just be spiritual. Let's mm -hmm. all get together with the imam and the rabbi and the priest and whoever else and, you know, just pray <laughs> and then share our food and dance. Yes. Because we're all here together. Exactly. We're one human race and we need to treat each other well, no matter where you come from or how you were raised. That's how I feel. So I don't have a religion per se. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it's just that. So continue with spiritualism. Yeah, that's what so, I <laughs> yeah. And where do you live in Canada? I live in Mississauga. Oh, okay. Oh, my goodness. My daughter's there right now visiting relatives. Yeah, I'm coming to Brampton and Hell. a week or two we're gonna meet up <laughs> well you never know no i'm 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 actually coming i don't want to continue because i'm taking people's place but i'm going to my mother's funeral she made it to 103 oh that's that's okay so, i'm so sorry for your loss well yeah it's a loss but at the same time you celebrate her life you know she gets sick she was refusing to be fed she just said it's time for me to go go to sleep and she'll go straight to heaven. <laughs> Our soul rest in peace. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So that's about all I have to say. I just, you know, wanted to share this with you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Rina. Yeah. Okay. And Yasmin, I'm coming to Victoria. I might look you up. Okay, wonderful. I'm not there anymore, but we'll chat. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my God. Then I'll find you. <laughs> okay. That's all right. I'll um, email you. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Neda, well, Neda, were you next or was Inas next? I don't know. Um, I think Inas is next and um, some person named Moomin. Yeah, that's Moomin. That's her husband. It's not hers. Yeah. It's the... They can go first. Okay, okay. Inas, go ahead. Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the invitation and thank you, Yasmin. And thanks uh, everybody here. Um, actually, Laura, I I want to tell you I feel all the pain. I was uh, myself uh, born and raised in Saudi Arabia with a dictator, Palestinian father. But I know exactly uh, uh, what you say and uh, how it can be. And I feel uh, Regina and Nada, I was uh, born in El Hassa and uh, wow. I know the pain exactly. Um, and I want to tell you, 
uh, Yasmin, I just finished your book today before the episode. Uh, and um, I can't I can't praise you enough actually. Yani, thank you for this book. This will be an yani uh, lightening to to uh, many many Muslim girls, and it will be guiding um, Yasmin. I can't thank you enough for expressing your feelings. What, what even your weaknesses and your strength in in such a very nice language and I'm sure it is in English better than in Arabic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want uh, I have a comment uh, for um, uh, Dina. Um, I hope. Um, Every time, not, not uh, every. She was a lucky one. She should uh, appreciate her parents and uh, their way of raising her. Um, for please, um, defense the girls, the Muslim girls who are suffering, not. The religion, mm -hmm. yeah. but this yeah because yani we are yani we had a lot and the, the stories um, we cannot finish the stories actually of the ladies in Arabic words. Um, so I want just this because it is common. Uh, this comment is common. Yani I'm a Muslim. My father is religious. I've never been uh, exposed to this. Exposed uh, in um, uh, one talk with uh, call with uh, Yasmin, I told her exactly this. Yani, whoever, even the the ones, um, um, my ex husband, he he was expressing himself as a liberal European um, like that when I asked for divorce. He told me go to the Mahkama Sharia, the the Sharia court. Sharia court, and that you hate and see if uh, those sheikhs and uh, sheikhs and uh, uh, religious uh, men, religion men, will how they will make you divorce me. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will uh, hold on to, to everything to let you down. Even if it is against them, they will go to Islam. When to, they need it. Uh, 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 oh, to grasp anything to humiliate you, to make you down, to make you feel worthless, to make you feel helpless. Because they know if you went there, but that's a bad Thank God by our thank, uh, thank the Jesus. universe. <laughs> <laughs> thank anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank us. Thank yeah. Thank uh, ourselves, Yani, mm -hmm. because we stood, we fought, we uh, did it. We by any means, and we nailed it. Finally, it is not so smooth or soft or uh, like that it is not something to underrate all our sufferings are not something to underrate uh, uh, for uh, yani i just wanted to this to uh, to be clear defense the girls the muslim girls who are suffering not by any mean try to defense or support the religion or say Islam doesn't say this because mm. my I I I am in a Muslim community and I I didn't feel that I didn't suffer that. Yes. It says yes. you were one of the luckiest because of your parents. Thank I I send I send all the love for them. I don't know them, but I send all the love for them. Um, and uh, what you your I'm so sorry, Taban, for uh, your brother, your loss. Um, and um, 
it might be that that best thing happened to him. Unfortunately, we can. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. By all this turmoils inside him. Yes. Some I sometimes you feel. It is natural. I know. Uh, uh, yani, I, I feel your pain exactly. Regina, uh, all the girls were born. Uh, I feel the Saudis and the Gulf area girls more uh, because we were resident. Yani, imagine if we were resident in Saudi Arabia and uh, it was a disaster. Yes. But what about Saudi mm. origin? Yeah. For, uh, the, the Saudis, really, the ladies of Saudi Arabia. And uh, for Regina, I uh, I want to say, uh, I studied there, um, the girls in Saudi Arabia and in Gulf area, 100 times brilliant and clever and uh, yes. uh, more than their beers of uh, boys. There is no comparison between this and that. No. Between, because the Sahya Laura, for yes. sure, I'm 100% yes. Everybody lived there, felt how they are uh, artistic, uh, open minded, uh, brilliant, very and kind, very loving. They support each other. Yeah, yeah. And they are the boys in Saudi Arabia because they are pampered, very spoiled. Yeah, everything is okay for them, and nothing is okay for girls actually. <laughs> <laughs> Not nothing at all. Yani, mm -hmm. if we are resident and we were suffering from this, what about them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my mother used to say, I'm sorry for uh, elongating this. Um, my mother used to say, uh, uh, girl um, in East is born in debt and the boy is born with a credit card. Hmm. Exactly. Yes. Yani, this is the thing. And uh, I hope uh, to see you all, all successful and happy and uh, liberated from anything and everything. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I feel so happy to listen to Sahara, to um, uh, Nada, to uh, every one of you, and the comments of Naz uh, Na Nazreen and mm -hmm. uh, um, and all of you actually, Rina and. Uh, all those uh, they don't um, know Islam, <laughs> but Yemi, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry that, that I I took so long. <laughs> thank you so much, Ines. Thank you so much for sharing. That was wonderful. Um, Nada. Yeah. Um. Uh, shukran Inas. My, uh, my comment is regarding Nasreen and how her parents are just amazing and um, also about Islamophobia and how uh, the West is very apologetic and protective of Islam and Muslims and uh, they, um, they portray it as a religion of peace, that um, terrorism has nothing to do with Islam. And then they um, white guilt themselves and they criticize themselves. And they talk about, well, Christianity did this and this, and then the Crusades and all of that. But the thing is, what differ differentiates Christianity from Islam and how, from my point of view, it's not Islamophobia, it's that Christianity has progressed, has moved on from those fundamental beliefs and the, the Old Testament stories into it being um, an accepting spiritual religion. Of course, there are some fundamentalists here and there, but for the most part, 
they preach that religion is love. Yes. Islam hasn't hasn't reached that point yet. It's the word of God. There is no deviation from the word of God, and it's just stated as um, a matter of fact. And for that is where violence lays. It's, it's where oppression is. And instead of it being something that lifts people spiritually, it's um, an indoctrination, it's a system, it's, it's an authoritarian religion of sorts. It's like North Korea, but for religion. And so when told people realize and they progress past that, we'll still have stories like ours. There will still be women who are oppressed and they're half a mount's worth and they'd be stuck in Sharia um, courts because they cannot get um, a divorce until they pay their husbands a large amount of money. So they're granted divorce. And they lose their life as well for asking yeah. to be divorced. And their children. Yeah. We and lost now that them. they lost, yeah. And now that they lost their virginity. True. That she was going to marry her. Mm -hmm. She's used goods. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. It was so yeah. freeing to be used goods. Can I just say that? <laughs> it's so freeing. So I was so happy after divorcing yeah. that piece of shit that they made me marry because that pressure that was on me before I married him, it wasn't there anymore for my family because it's like, eh, the seal is already broken on this vitamin bottle. So we're not so concerned about her anymore. You know, mm -hmm. like you talked about um, moving out women in Saudi Arabia, moving out on their own. Um, Leora, you were saying that legally it's allowed, but of course there's still families that are going to punish their daughters. They could even, you know, honor, kill their daughters. Regina was saying here that there's still, um, honor killing is still not punishable by the law. Exactly. Yeah. So you could kill your daughter because she moved out on her own, even though technically it's legal. So, um, but for me, like when I divorced him with, I could with my daughter, I moved out on our own. And of course I was, my mom was angry and she was mortified and she was ashamed, but I never, ever could have even imagined doing that if I wasn't already divorced. You know, it does offer you some freedom that yes. that protection that they have over your virginity that obsession over your virginity has kind of been released and now you're like you know you're already used goods anyway so even if you move you out on your own or now you can yes. ride a bicycle now you can go to university you can do whatever because you're already used so <laughs> yeah Uh, I'm assuming your name isn't Mebin, so I don't know what to call you, but Mebin. <laughs> Hi, it's Margaret. Oh, Margaret! Margaret Hi. is one of my incredibly generous supporters of Free Hearts, Free Minds, which I don't talk about enough on this. So Margaret, if you'll just allow me for a second to give a little bit of a, a spiel about my organization, Free Hearts, Free Minds. Okay which is an organization that supports people who have left Islam and specifically people from the LGBT community as well who have left Islam because those are the two groups in Muslim majority world in the Muslim majority world who are persecuted and even executed for their beliefs or for who they love. Um, and so I'm very proud of my organization and I'm very proud of the people that work with me, Joanna, Aisha and Jessica, and I could not be more grateful for the people that keep it up and running. And you're about to hear from one of them right now. Margaret is one of our donors, and we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to help anybody if it wasn't for the support of generous people like Margaret. 
Thank you, Yasmin. Um, Libra, I just had a question. Um, I'm just curious about within the Sudanese community, if the events like in Darfur and kind of the civil war, were they discussed at all? And if they were discussed, was it sort of, you know, um, in the lens of kind of a, a tribal conflict or was it like the Northern Sudanese Muslims versus the Kufar or like how was, was it discussed at all? And if so, were people in denial about what was going on and did they kind of use um, Islamic ideas to justify it? Like was, um, what was your experience with that? Well, I never, um, I never lived in Sudan. I only stayed there during the university, which was just two years. But right now, the, there, there is a revolution again in Sudan. Um, and if you're talking about, we're talking about North and South, it, they used to have a war for, for many decades. And just because of uh, how different the religion is and them not wanting to be ruled by Muslims and Muslims not wanting to accept them as well. And they were racist um, towards them. Um, I'm really, I'm one of the supporters for the, um, for them having their own country, right? Uh, but what's happening in Darfur now is not being uh, spoken about as well as what's happening in Sudan and Khartoum. Um, they're just, they're not talking about it. Um, so they just see it as a tribal conflict that no one is doing anything to, to help. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, um, thank you so much, Leora, for giving us two hours of your time. Um, I just wanna make sure that there's nobody else that wanted to share any questions or comments before we wrap up. I see that Nazreen, you wrote a lot of really great comments in the in the chat, um, and I respect that you didn't want to turn on your camera and speak with us today, but I hope that you will in the future because you have some really insightful things to say. Um, one of the things that you talked about here, just one of your final comments, you said, the sad part is a lot of young women my age, well-educated ones, seem to get more and more radicalized and are sticking to patriarchal customs. That is incredibly sad. Oh, good. Nasreen is gonna share. <laughs> All right, please Hi. go ahead and unmute. Hi. Hi, it's my first time in uh, on uh, one of your Zooms and I just recently discovered you. So I just wanted to spend today, you know, just listening and seeing uh, what it's like, but it's been amazing. Um, but what I was talking about is maybe a lot of my cousins, especially the ones who are so, uh, I don't know, just so much fun and extroverted and open even more than I was as a kid. So I went through a phase of radicalization where I sort of, you know, was a hijab of my own accord and things like that. Um, and then, you know, learned a lot and came out of it. But um, I see the opposite happening with a lot of other women my age, especially those who got married early and things like that. And they sort of, have this hatred for I guess like western ideals quote-unquote and capitalism and they just <laughs> are trying yeah. to be counter-cultural I think but it's um I don't like what what it might be doing to my uh nieces and you know they lean towards like uh homeschooling and things like that so yeah it, it's just very weird yeah we had that happen a lot in the Arab world, right, Leora? Like just an anti, anti-Western sentiment turns into pro-Islamist sentiment. Like they're always hand in hand. Leora, did you want to comment on that? On what oh, Nazreen no, said? Yeah, yeah, you did. Thank you, Nazreen, for being here. Appreciate you. And thank you, Yasmin, also for doing these. Um, I'm going to hope, I hope there'll be more of these and uh, when I attend more of them. And thank you, Lyra, for being so brave. God bless you. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> you can be yourself. I can be myself. We just love each other and respect each other regardless. So thank you. 
if you want to say god bless you it's okay i say god all the time i say oh my god i say <laughs> thank god i just just, just whatever yourself. that means the universe like you know um I always say like, I don't know what the answer is and I don't know what the truth is, but I know that there was no God that wrote that shitty book. That's what I know for sure. <laughs> That's the only thing I can say for sure that there was no God that wrote a book about how the earth was flat and women should be beaten and all that other garbage. Um, but I obviously when that's part of being a free thinker and part of being open-minded is that you are not going to close your mind off and say i know the truth as soon as you say i know the truth you stop learning and i'm never going to do that again delida oh. we're never going to get out of here you're going to be in this call for the next week <laughs> uh, hi hello how's everyone hi how are you uh, I really appreciate and I thank Laura for getting the courage and speaking out. This is not an easy topic at all. So uh, I really appreciate her for this. And I thank each and every lady for speaking out about it and making this organization. It's really great. I don't really have a question, but rather I have a comment or, or something to add to it, okay? I am born a Christian and I am um, uh, born and raised in the Middle East as well. Hmm. One thing I want to um, let you out there to know is that it's not usually about the religion. It's not because I am born a Christian, yet I'm facing the same issue that almost each and every one of you is facing or faced, should I say faced, for uh, in your case it's it's past tense already in my case it's still happening um my dad is still you know close-minded not willing to let girls be free be open be out there i mean i'm, I'm i graduated i have my master's degree but i still can't pick where to work which job should I work? Is it, is it mixed? Are there men in your department? I'm not allowed to, I still have a curfew. I'm in my, I'm in my 30s, I still have curfew. Am I gonna blame the country that I'm in? No, because they allowed women to be free. They allowed women you know, you're, it's okay. You don't have to cover yourself when you go out. Yet in my house, I mean, where I, where I stay, you know, you, you're, you're still supposed to cover up when you go out. You're not allowed to say certain things. You go where I want you to go. You be where I want you to be. That's not easy at all. I'm still living it. How can I break free? I'm still scared. If I break free, Will the rest of the family be in trouble because of me? It led to health issues. I'm still dealing with. So I don't think it's really religion. It's not. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. And I'm, I'm really sorry you're going through that. And um, all I can say is that I hope that one day you're going to break free and find the freedom that you're seeking. Uh, sometimes when I, when, when I try to give an advice to someone who's still living this, just it's so hard for me because I know what they're going through and I've been there and it's really, it's really difficult. Like you have to be the light to yourself in order to get out of that state of, of depression, that state of, you know, not wanting to, to live anymore. 
And it's really hard when it's your family because you realize that you just have to, to let go of them in order to find your peace. And this is what happened with me. Uh, my own family was, was my brother. And Dalida, you know that because I, I knew you through him. Um, but the, he's been my family. And once I lost that, I just, I, I left the whole thing, right? And it's, it's been liberating for me. Um, I, I don't really know what to tell you. I'm, I'm here for you. If you need to talk more every day, you can call me, you can talk to me. I'm going to be here until, until you're free. And we're going to celebrate together. <laughs> Just don't give up on yourself. That's, that's my advice to you. That you're going to have a lovely life. Just think of that. And I love you, sister. <laughs> Delita, thank you so much for having the courage to, to share your perspective and your experiences with us. I'm really glad that you were here. Um, you know that you have a supportive group of people who will help you on your journey, like Leora said. Um, I know your chains are a different shape than ours. You know, for us, it was religion. For you, it's something else. But, you know, we do have a common struggle as women wanting to get free from, you know, patriarchal structures, whatever it is. Um, and we can support each other in that, in that journey. So um, again, thank you so much, sending you love and strength. And I hope that you join more and more of these Forgotten Feminists because it's really, really inspiring Lovely. to hear from women who have been where you are right now and to see how they have grown, how they have survived, how they have thrived, because it motivates you. And it lets you know that if they could do it, I can do it. Um, and like Leora said, just visualize your future and don't give up. Don't give up on yourself. Just keep pushing forward. And so many people in the comments are sending you love. So I hope that you're reading those. Um, so before we close up, Leora, um, I just want to make sure that you had an opportunity to say everything that you wanted to say, um, before we conclude our conversation today. Well, I don't have anything else to say, but thank you so much for having me. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share my story for the first time after eight years and more, more than eight years. But thank you, I really uh, appreciate all the amazing souls who are here today. Um, and to the women who are still in that world and countries, I just want them to not give up on themselves because it's, it's easily to give up on yourself and say, okay, they want me to marry this man, so I'm just gonna get married to this man. Or if they want me to do that, um, I'm gonna, do it because it will it will make life easier but life will not be easier you're going to go through a lot more and you're going to be end up just being traumatized uh, don't give up on yourself um, let your goal your beautiful dream be your your inspiration you have to inspire yourself because you're living with people sometimes even women will will put you down and tell you no don't do that because men will not accept it or you'll be disowned by your family Choose yourself, choose your peace, and live your life. Beautiful. Thank you so much. What a wonderful positive note to end on. Thank you so much, Leora. Thank, thank you, you especially for giving us so much of your time. And thank you for everyone that has joined us here today. And I look forward to seeing you every second Saturday at the next Forgotten Feminists. Yes. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.